old hymns. We do not sing it much, but uh, one of the old hymns that have been around a long time. Aren't you glad that God gave you the ability to remember, be able to remember some things of the past? Oh, I know every one of us say, uh, well, I just wish I could remember like I used to. Well, the good thing for you older people is that you remember the things that were way back there. It's just recent things you can't remember, right? And so, anyway, uh, precious memories. What a beautiful song. Thank you, choir. I had a couple of extra choir members up here today. Ty Thomas, we recruited them. The Barrett's over here. And uh, <clears throat> glad they're here in Williamsport, Pennsylvania with us. Visiting, we have some that are out of town, vacations and so on. And uh, some came to town. And so we're thrilled to always to have these uh, around. Uh, Ty, if you come on up here, I'm going to read scripture. If you come on up here, ladies, a prayer, please. I'm going to read from Proverbs chapter number 21, verse number 31. Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Once again, we're glad to have Ty home with us for this weekend. And of course, grew up right here, graduated from the Williamsport Christian School in 1994, I think. Is that it? Is that 1994? Thank you. And uh, so that was a little while ago. You don't, he doesn't look that old, does he? Uh, anyway, of course, grew up and served in the bus ministry, the choir, everything. Everything went on. He was right here in the middle, of course, the last, oh, about uh, 20 years, 20, uh, let's see, about 21 years. He's done 21 years, a couple yes. weeks. Yes, wow, that's amazing. Anyway, uh, been working with his father in law. Think of that. His father in law is a pastor in Beckham, West Virginia. He's been the assistant now all this time. And been faithfully staying at it. I praise God for Ty and, and his dedication to the Lord Jesus Christ. So thrilled to have him home always. He's going to pray for us. Thank you. It's always good to be home. And we talk about the precious memories. And that's how I always feel when I come back here to this church. Um, so many precious memories. I got saved back there in Pastor Bixler's office when I was 15 years old after basketball practice on October 14, 1991. I'm always grateful for the influence of this ministry. And I wouldn't be where I am today had it not been for this church and this ministry here. So thank you for your faithfulness, Pastor. Make sure on the church family as well. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness. Lord, we thank you for the privilege we have to gather together this morning and worship you. And Lord, I pray that this morning, uh, many of us have things that are on our minds, on our hearts, uh, things we're maybe thinking about, concerned about, or praying about. I pray, Lord, that this morning uh, we would dismiss all those things and just focus on you and on bringing honor and glory to your precious and holy name, for you deserve it. Of course, in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Thank you so much. It's Memorial Day, uh, Memorial Day weekend, and uh, what a marvelous, marvelous thing that we have. Not a holiday, not picnics and all. That can be fun, but that's not what it's all about. It's to remember those that have allowed us this opportunity to be here today, that have given their lives. How many in this building right now are the ones that you, not just that you had somebody in the military, but somebody that, that their lives were taken away from them because of some war or something in the military? You one like that? I know my mother, her brother was killed in World War II. Is there anyone else to the back, either side? Anyone back here? All right, so I never met my uncle or brother but uh, he was a pilot and, uh, and, and was killed uh, as a plane crashed. And uh, I surely am thankful for those that gave their lives. For us that we've gone through life, it's been pretty easy most of the time. And uh, God has been good to us in America. We're going to sing some patriotic songs today. And just to commemorate America and to remember those that have gone on before us in that way. I invite you to get a hymn book, 583. And let's all stand. We're going to sing My Country Tis of Me. 583. Let's all stand. Sing with all of our heart. Our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. We're also love for our country.
new song today up through till July 4th, so the next month or so. And uh, turn to 586. I want to read the words to the, the verse, and we're just going to sing that on the second page uh, at the bottom. Hope it will be too confusing. Let me read all the words, and then we'll sing, Turn the Tide, Lord, or Turn the Tide, all the way to the part there on the next page where it says, uh, Tide, the finish there. But let me read the words of this first verse. It says, When America was founded, she was strong and pure and good. And her leaders on their knees were not ashamed to call God. But our nation in her, in her pride has turned her back upon the right. And the clouds of evil threaten to turn glory into night. Strong wickedness has crept in like a cold and bloody thief. Those who know the Lord and do his word stand by in disbelief. For the love of God and country must, cease, must not cease for a day. For the future of our children... We must lift our hearts and pray. And then we're going to sing this. Like I said, we'll sing this for a while now, the next several weeks, and hope we learn it. But it's turn the tide, Lord. Oh, turn the tide. Open wide the floodgates, the floodgates of your power. Stem the flood of wickedness to restore, revive, and bless. Turn the tide. And so that's what we're going to sing, just those three lines. So hope you're not too confused. Just 586 on that second part. The fourth line down where it says turn the tide and then we'll finish on that next page on that top line. All right, let's try it twice. Turn the tide. And uh, Lida Bell, of course, we just loved, and her husband Larry went to be with the Lord 
about a year ago, a little bit over a year ago. And just we just love Larry Lightabelle, of course, all of our. But then there's the next generation. And uh, they have five children. All of those are serving the Lord. Most all, all but one, are down there. Almost like a compound, right? <laughs> they're, they're all there together, working in the church together in Brazil. And now the next generation. And so Stephen, I'm going to have you pray here in a moment for the offering. But uh, anyway, he's going about looking now for support on his own. He has no wife. He's just traveling America, which is a foreign country to him. It's not really foreign, but it's foreign, right? Second home. Yeah, it's second home. <laughs> and so they just happened to be in the area and said to each other, let's go through Emmanuel today. I'm thrilled. I looked, turned around here. They were standing down here. And my heart was starting to be, and I'm just thrilled to have them here with us today. Anyone that needs a bulletin, would you lift up your hand? And I tell you what, before we go any further, we've got to sing happy birthday to Hazel. And uh, yesterday was her yesterday was her birthday, and she turned 16. <laughs> Just stand there a moment, Hazel. Some of the people don't know you. I wanted to see this 16-year-old. All right, and there she is. Yesterday was her birthday, 96 years old. She's been here in Emmanuel for about. I think it was around 1978, 79, maybe you came the first time. So it's uh, been a long, long, long time. She sang in the choir again, rode buses. One thing about Hazel, she was always so important in the bus ministry because very often she made cookies for all the bus kids and came, rode the bus, and uh, was deeply involved. Lived up there in, uh, in Scott Street. And uh, God bless you, Hazel. I'm glad you're able to be in the house of God today. Amen. And uh, Debbie and I stopped at her house yesterday on her birthday in Jersey Shore, where she lives now. You may be seated. And uh, wished her a happy birthday yesterday. And I'm thrilled to think 96 years God's allowed her to be upon this earth. And about 45 of that, I guess we've known her. Uh, almost half, almost half of your life I've known you. Think of that. And about 90, 99% of my life I've known you. Something like that. Anyway, God bless you, Hazel. And uh, we're going to sing happy birthday. And so, Brother James, lead us, please. Please, trustees, write in your bulletin 
Uh, we're just getting this in the bulletin, but we announced at the last meeting, but we will be having a trustees meeting that's coming up Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. That'll be over at the library next door. And so wives, you can write that in. Your husbands don't know how to write. So you, you can write that in there. Ladies, make sure they remember Tuesday night, 7 o'clock there next door on Wednesday. Uh, why don't you come on and say something about Wednesday and next Sunday night as well. This Wednesday night is our conclusion of our Master Club. We've had a great year. We've had about 25 children every Wednesday night. We normally start at 6.30 or start at 6 o'clock this Wednesday night with a final time of uh, game time. is going to be extended. And uh, your parents, when you bring them, they don't have to be uh, had to eat yet. We're going to have pizza and cupcakes and other snacks and drinks and all that. And so be here at 6 o'clock. We'll feed them and have games longer, and we'll practice some. Then that night after we head over to the building, uh, we're going to prepare. We're going to have a little program next Sunday night, June the 5th, and that Sunday night service, each group from the youngest all the way up will be reciting verses and, and doing some different things that they've learned and accomplished this year in Master Clubs. And so look forward to that next Sunday night, June the 5th. So parents, have them here at 6 o'clock this Wednesday night, and then have them here next Sunday night for that meeting. I also want to mention about the Bill Rice Ranch, because we're only two weeks from today, we'll be heading to camp. And we're excited, and a lot have signed up. There's still a few trying to decide and all those things. And so two weeks from today, we'll be heading to camp. Next Sunday night, if your parents make sure you take a note in the teenage bulletins, next Sunday night, we'll have a meeting at 530 in the teen room down there, just kind of go over things, preparing for camp. And there is still one, maybe two, that are looking for some sponsorship money. So if there is any that still like to give, if it's $50 or $100 or whatever, Lord lays in your heart to help uh, one or two of these ones that are still wanting to go, uh, please see me as soon as possible. And we'd like to get them registered and looking forward to a great week, two weeks from today. All right, Dr. Bill Rice was just here about a month ago. and. We just uh, enjoyed the Bill Rice Ranch camp there in Murfreesboro, Tennessee all these years. I did as a teenager, and we keep on doing it, and it's a blessed, blessed time they will have. Please be praying safety. Pray for the Bill Rice Ranch. Pray for us as we travel to the Bill Rice Ranch. Thursday night, our visitation work. Also, on Friday this week, uh, we're going to be having a father-son. We'll call it a father-son, but if you don't have a son, it's fine. You can come. But we're going to be going to Altoona to a baseball game there. And there's a sign-up sheet right down here on the uh, table. Uh, if you're planning on going, please come and sign up. I know there's a couple different ones that want to go, but just different snags and scheduling. But perhaps there's still someone here in the auditorium, you, your son, grandson. Uh, we'll meet here at the church at 3.30, Friday afternoon, 3.30. And uh, I want to encourage you, even if you don't like baseball, I know these days people are a lot more into basketball and even football, but um, baseball is the thinking man sport, right? Oh, yeah. Anyway, it's a great time. Even if you don't like baseball, come along just for the fellowship, just to be together. And uh, we'll have a great time over there at, at Altoona and 3.30. Uh, the cost will be about $10 per ticket. Of course, whatever you want, would like to eat, that'll be your business. In that regard, but we'll meet here at 3.30. Please sign up, and any mail, all your mails uh, are welcome to come along with us. Ushers, come ahead, wait on us for that offering, and uh, Miss Heidi will be playing on the piano for us today. Let's ask God's blessings upon that. No, I'm not going to pray, but you are, Stephen. We will ask God's blessings upon it, but uh, Stephen Barrett, missionary to Brazil, again, this grandparents, his parents, now the third generation uh, of missionaries in Brazil, and I'm so thrilled to have him, and he'll lead us in prayer today. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for this wonderful privilege it is to be here today and visit our precious friends and church family here. Thank you, Lord, for everybody who's here today. It's so wonderful to see brethren in Christ together, worshiping you and honoring your name, Lord. We remember now, uh, we thank you for the freedom that we have in this country, Lord, and thank you for those who gave their lives so that we could be here and preach and sing and knock on doors and preach the gospel still, Lord. Help us to never take this freedom for granted, Lord. Thank you for this time of offering. May everything that uh, we do today be done for your honor and your glory, Lord. And once again, I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.
that's that's so perfect. I love it. Thank you. Please turn to 587. America the beautiful. Let's all sit here, please, and sing it out. America the beautiful. Oh, we live in a beautiful country, but uh, greater than that is it's beautiful because of the saved people, the ones that are saved in America. Think about our country. 587. America the beautiful. Thank you. 
much for the song there this morning. And a uh, great song, but I guess for me it's a convicting song, isn't it? And you consider those words, do they see Jesus in me? And uh, when people watch our lives throughout the week at work or here at church, our own spouses, our children, do they see Jesus in me? And that's a convicting message, isn't it, in that song? And uh, when we spend time like with somebody, we begin to be like them. When we spend time with Jesus, we begin to look like Jesus, act like Jesus, talk like Jesus. And so this week, did people see Jesus in how you acted? And uh, thank you so much for that song. Appreciate that. Before we uh, go any farther, I'm going to be dealing with the subject of laying down our lives and thinking about soldiers and, and the bravery of what ones have done. But can we recognize here... Quickly, many of you I know have served our country, men or women that have served in some branch of the military. Would you mind just standing for a moment if you have? I know some of these gentlemen back here, but Mike, Jeff, and Bobby here, uh, three of these ones. Anybody else have served in our country and been involved in some branch of the military? And uh, all right, let's give these guys a hand. Thank you very much for being seated. And I enjoy talking with these, these guys. I've heard some of their stories and, and uh, appreciate what they've done. And I have the freedom and the privilege to stand up here and preach today because of these gentlemen. Thursday night, we were knocking on doors. Caitlin was with me. Second door that we knocked on, young lady came to the door. She just finished her freshman year of college and nursing at Penn College and began to talk to her. And she didn't know for sure she was going to heaven. We opened up the Bible, explained the gospel, and she prayed and got saved. And uh, it was actually Mr. Spittler, one of the funeral directors, and it was his, his granddaughter. And we were thrilled about that, but she got saved, and she now has a home in heaven. But it, once again, it was back to these men and many men and women that have, brave, have courageously given their lives and have, have, have laid down their lives so we can have the freedom to knock on doors in America and that I can speak Jesus' name uh, freely door to door in this town. And so thank you for your service. Please take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. I'm just going to read this one verse to start out today. And I'm pulling away from the series that we've been preaching on, the life of David. And this message is just for today. And so this is more of a topical message, but thinking about uh, what has happened over all these years and the, the people that have given their lives for our freedom. Look at John 15, 13. The Bible says this. Greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Let me read that again. Greater love have no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. If you're in the habit of marking your Bible and phrases, I want you to mark those four words. Lay down his life. Lay down his life. As we consider Memorial Day, a day to honor, remember those ones, millions of people that have laid down their lives for us. Memorial Day is an American holiday observed the last Monday of May, honoring the men and women who died while serving in the U.S. military. Originally known as Decoration Day, it originated in the years following the Civil War and became the, an official federal holiday in 1971. Many Americans observe Memorial Day by visiting cemeteries or, memori or memorials, holding family gatherings, participating in parades, and this is unofficially marks the beginning of the summer season. The Civil War, which ended in 1865, claimed more lives than any conflict in the U.S. history and required the establishment of the country's first national cemetery. I was looking up some of the different wars, and I enjoy history. And my favorite of all the wars is studying those different battles, and what went on was the war for independence, and when America was fighting for our independence from England. And in that war, there was 4,435 individuals, men, that died in that war. But in the Civil War, which is my second favorite war to study, uh, we had more than 500,000 men that were killed in that war. So after this war, they set up this place for these uh, this tribute. By the late 1860s, Americans in various towns and cities had begun holding springtime tributes to these countless fallen soldiers, decorating their graves with flowers and reciting prayers. 
On the first decoration day, General James Garfield made a speech at Arlington National Cemetery, and 5,000 participants uh, decorated the graves of 20,000 Civil War soldiers buried there. And now all of these years to follow, we continue to honor the ones from World War I and World War II, and Vietnam War, the Korean War, and Iraq and Afghanistan. And this is a day to remember those ones that have bravely given their lives for our freedom in America. More than 1.1 million men and women have died in the U.S. throughout these wars of the War of Independence till this day. I had something in the team bulletin with some statistics. I believe it said 300 billion, 3 billion people from all the years of wars across this war, world have died. So many people. Thank God someday there'll be no more wars or rumors of wars. And we'll be in heaven. That final war at that battle Armageddon, Jesus Christ will win. And then we'll have total peace forever. But we still have wars. And today we'll honor those ones that have laid down their lives for us. As we come to the passage in John 15, 13, we read once again, Greater love have no man of this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Look at verse number 12. Jesus is speaking here to his disciples, and he says in verse number 12, This is my commandment. Anytime you see in the Bible that a commandment is given forth, especially when Jesus is speaking, my ears perk up and I want to hear it and I want to follow and obey it. And Jesus says, this is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. In this verse, Jesus gives a commandment to love one another, to love our fellow friends, our family, people around us. And then Jesus says, as I have loved you. Jesus then in verse 13 explains what love consists of. Jesus explains what the true example of love is. When he is challenging his disciples to love one another, he then goes on to say this. This is what love is. That you lay down your life for your friend. Lay down your life for your friend. And the greatest form of love is to do that. And that is what the soldiers over all these years have done. They have laid down their lives for their fellow comrades there, but have ultimately laid down their life for our country and for freedom in, this, in, in America. I remember when my dad was meeting with Heidi and I, we were engaged to be married, and we were sitting there on his couch in his office, and he asked this to all the couples that are, he's going to marry, and uh, he says, he started it with Heidi, which I was glad, make her be awkward and not know what to say, but I, what, tell me um, what love means. And so she spit out some words, and, and they didn't know what to say, and then he said, James, tell me what love is, and anybody else been in that office, the pastors talked to you in that area, okay. Uh, so you're back there, and you're trying to figure out what to say. You're a little bit embarrassed, and, uh, you know, I knew what the answer was. I, love is that you're willing to die for Heidi, right? That's the right words. And, um, and, and so he went on to explain what true love is, loving her more than loving myself and all those things. But that's truly the greatest form of love, that you'd be willing to lay down your life for them. As we continue to pray for the families and, and grieve over what happened this past week in our country, in the state of Texas, when that gunman came into that classroom of those innocent little children, the same age as my Morgan, and they were killed. But that one teacher, I read a story that she was there shielding those children with her body and took bullets and died and laid down her life for her students. And so the same lady, your husband, actually died of a heart attack just this past Thursday, dealing with all the grief. I mean, we remember and pray for these folks. But that lady laid down her life for those little kids. That is, to me, when Jesus speaks the words here and says, love one another. When she was teaching those children, it was more than a paycheck. It was more than just an occupation. She was demonstrating verse 13 of what love is. She laid down her life for those children. And today I want to look at two different people groups, individuals that laid down their lives for us. But then the last people group is us and how we need to lay down our lives for others. I want to start with number one today laid down his life. First of all, a soldier lays down his life for his friends. 
Taking notes today, start with S's, these different names of people. Number one, a soldier lays down his life for his friends. Let me pray. Dear Lord, we pray to bless the preaching of your word as we look at some stories and think about true love and the love you've demonstrated to us that you'd be willing to lay down your life for us, wicked sinners, that you die for our sins. Holy Spirit, be our teacher today. Convict us, teach us, comfort us, lead us in the way that you want us to be led today through your word. And Lord, may we bring you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. A soldier lays down his life for his friends. You realize when these three gentlemen, I've not been in that position, I'm too big of a chicken, I guess, when I was 18 or 19, God had called me to that field, but, um, but these three men, I'd be willing right now to take up arms and fight if I had to, um, but these three men were willing to accept the fact that they could die on that battlefield. And, and when they listed, in, in, when they were involved in boot camp and their training and, and eventually when they went over to fight, they knew every time they went out, every, dot, every morning they woke up, they knew there was a possibility that their life would be taken. A soldier lays down his life for his friends. And as I think back, and I'll look at a story example of three men that laid down their life for their king. Turn back to 2 Samuel, please. 2 Samuel chapter 23. And eventually I'm going to get to some of this because we've been teaching on the preaching on the life of David and we're not there yet. We're only in chapter 2. But in chapter 23, David's speaking here. He's an older man now. His last words, he's speaking about these mighty men that he had that served in his army. Now I love that first statement in verse 8. First, 2 Samuel 23, it says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. And it goes through the list of their names and what they did. But well, wouldn't that be a great thing that somebody said about you? These are the mighty men that Jesus had in his army. Or these are the mighty men and women that fought for the army and the military of America. And that's what David said about these men. But then look at verse number 14. And David was then in a hold. And the garrisons of the Philistines was, was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, On that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. Now look at verse 17. And he said, David said, be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink of it. These things did these three mighty men. These mighty men laid down their life for their king. And he was, just, he was more than a king to them. He was their friend. And David here, not command these men or even requesting them, just a vocalized longing for water. They immediately went to fulfill David's desire at a great pers personal risk. To go to this well and retrieve this water and bring it back for their king. There was a loyalty to their king. And let me say this, we don't have much loyalty nowadays. It's not as hard to be loyal to certain leadership in our country. But hey, I hope today that there is a loyalty to your king, King Jesus. And I hope there is loyalty to America and that you love this country and you pray for this country and you'd be willing to do anything for this country. But these three mighty men were willing to break through the camp of the Philistines, break through that enemy line and go get the wet water out from the well and then run back through. Can you see this scene? And maybe you're reflecting about some of the different wars that maybe you like, maybe you're war one or two buff, or maybe you think watched a lot and read a lot of Vietnam because that was your age group or recent wars. Can you see these men, maybe with their swords or with their bow and arrows, maybe more recent days, somebody with a gun or, or some weapon, and you now you're trying to decide when do we go? All right, let's go in at night, or let's try to sneak through that enemy line. And here they go, and they start going, and they run for all they're worth, and maybe Back then, they weren't shooting guns. Maybe there were some arrows flown their way or maybe some spare spears thrown at them. And they go and they risk their life. David says here that this is the blood of men that went in jeopardy. They're jeopardizing their life for their king. And these soldiers laid down their life and they got the water and they came back through the enemy line and they bring it to their king. Well, they didn't die in this instance, but they were willing to die for their king. And David takes this water 
I'm not going to pour this on the floor. We already had some water in the door over there from a storm Friday, so we don't need any more water in here. But he took the water and he poured it out and said, I'm not even worthy to drink of this water. And honor respecting these men's courage and their bravery and their love towards their king. A soldier lays down his life for his friend. Let me say this this morning. We are soldiers in God's army. 2 Timothy 2 verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. There's two, two teams you can be on today. You're either on God's team or you're on the devil's team, right? There's two teams. You pick your team. I hope today you're a believer. When you accepted Jesus Christ, you became a Christian, a little Christ, and you chose to be on God's team, God's army, right? If you're not saved today and you're on this team, I'd hurry up and accept Jesus and get on the right team because that's the team where you have eternal life and victory and peace and happiness. But there's two teams that you're, you're joining, one of two teams. And most of you today have prayed and by faith have accepted Jesus Christ in your heart to be your Lord and Savior. You're a believer. And so you're on team God over here. And the team captain, your commander-in-chief, your general is King Jesus. You as a soldier in God's army, are you willing to lay down your life for your friend? Are you willing to lay down your life for your king? These men in this story, their love and their, their devotion to their king and their friend would give them the courage to die to lay down their life. I want you to look in Acts chapter 7 of an amazing Christian man. He was not a, a pastor. The Bible says he was a deacon. An amazing Christian man that was willing to lay down his life for his king, King Jesus. Lay down his life. He was a soldier in the army of God. Look at Acts chapter 7 and verse 54. We, um, it says here in verse 54, when they heard these things, Acts 7, 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And witnesses laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In verse 16, he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. A soldier lays down his life for his friends. And I'm thankful for all the soldiers that have laid down their lives for, for their friends on the battlefields across this world. And for the soldiers that have laid down their lives for our freedom. But Stephen did something even maybe more valuable than that. He laid down his very life for his friend Jesus, his King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And took those stones and took those beatings and took that because he was willing to be devoted and courageous to lay down his life. Because of his love for Jesus. Remember verse 12. Jesus says that the commandment I give you is to love one another even as I have loved you. And then what's the example of that love? That you're willing to lay down your life. And Stephen did that. It tells us earlier in the passage that he was a man full of faith. And faith will give us the courage to do these kind of things. Are you today willing to lay down your life for Jesus? I think about so many missionaries that have been in terrible places across this world, that they hate Jesus, and they reject anything about Christianity, and they've taken a bullet for Jesus, or they've been put in prison for years and starved to death for Jesus. We think about the early disciples and how they were hung on crosses upside down, torn and sunder, stoned and left for dead. These people are heroes. They are soldiers in God's army that are willing to lay down their life Let's put it into our little world. And not to be rude to you or to me, but we might say, I'd take a bullet for Jesus, or I'd be willing to lay down my life for me to live as Christ and die as gain. I'd be willing to, if I was in a, that school shooting, or I was in that church shooting, or if I was in that situation, I would not deny Christ, and I'd stand up for Jesus. A lot of times, we have a hard time just pulling a track out of our pop pocket and telling somebody that Jesus loves us. Because we're afraid that we're going to be rejected or persecuted. 
Sometimes we have a hard time when we're, we're even at work just to bow our head and close our eyes and just pray and thank God for our food. Listen, when we truly love Jesus, a soldier is willing to do anything for him. And I hope today you'll be willing to do anything for your friend Jesus as a soldier. Number two, the Savior lays down his life for his friends. The Savior lays down his life for his friend. You all know the verse, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But boy, I love 1 John 3.16. Well, let me quote the first part, and then in my third point, we'll look at the second part of that verse. But in 1 John 3.16, the Bible says that the love of God, because of the love of God, he laid down his life for us. Because of God's love for James Bixler, for, because of the love of God for you, he laid down his very life for you. Turn back, if you're in John, to John chapter 10. This is the story, Jesus speaking here, of him being the good shepherd and laying his life down for the sheep. In John chapter 10, and look at verse number 9. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Isn't it wonderful? There's only one door. It's through Jesus Christ for salvation. But verse 10 says, The thief cometh not but to steal and to kill. This is the enemy. And to destroy I am come that they might have life, and that they might have life more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But look at verse number uh, 14. I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. That's us. Jesus, the good shepherd, lays down his life for us, the sheep. Look at verse 17. Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. Verse 18. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. Jesus gave his life for the sheep. Isaiah 53, 5 says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Our wonderful Savior laid down his life for every one of us today. In Isaiah 53, verse 7, part B, it says that he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. He was brought to be slaughtered and killed, innocent, perfect, to hang on that cruel cross for you and me. Took those nails in his hands and feet, took those beatings, took that crown thorn, took those whippings, took that rejection, took upon him all of our sins, and he paid your sin debt so you could be forgiven ever forevermore. The Savior, when he spoke those words to the disciples and said, I love you, and this is how much I love you, I'm going to lay my life down for you. He didn't just speak words, but his actions were demonstrated on that cross. When he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. We are all sinners and destined to hell. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. That should be our payment. But the gift of God is eternal life. God loved us so much and gave us a gift. Eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our wonderful Savior laid down his life for his friends. Aren't you thankful that he considered you a friend? That he'd be willing to lay down his life for you. We said, wow, what a courageous man or woman. They went to that burning building and laid down their life. A child they didn't even know and gave their life for that kid. Or somebody went into that frozen pond and, and they gave their own life. And that's amazing love. And we might die for a righteous or a good man, but scarcely for a wicked man. But Jesus died for every individual that's ever walked on this earth. The Savior lays down his life for his friends. But lastly, the saint lays down his life for his friend. The saint lays down his life for his friend. See, the soldier laid down his life for us, for our country. And the Savior lays down his life for us to be forgiven of all in heaven. But now it's applied to you and me today. What are you doing for your friends? What are you doing for others? Let's now turn to 1 John chapter 3. Once again, John 3, 16, we all know and love, but look at 1 John 3, 16. I'll let you get there. I want you to see it. 
1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Well, what is the love of God? It's right here because he laid down his life for us. That was our second point. And then it says this and apply it to our lives. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So the challenge is not just that Jesus laid down his life for us, and that's a great thing, and we're glad he did, and we're saved and forgiven, and we're proud of that, and we love him for that. But then he says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Think about that word brother, and that is those ones that are Christians, the family of God. We might say we're glad that Brother Ty is here today. Or we're glad that Brother Stevens here from out of town. Or that sister so-and-so. And I'm thankful for the family of God. I'm telling a lot of you, maybe you don't really have a great family. Your family is dysfunctional. And, and, and it's a mess. And they don't believe in your God. At times you feel frustrated in your family circle. Aren't you thankful that you can be a part of the family of God? Aren't you thankful that on a Sunday morning you can come sit arm to arm, sword to sword with men and women that love your God, that, you're, that are your brothers and sisters in Christ? That tonight you can go out and have a picnic and have a great time fellowshipping and eating. You don't have to worry about something going wrong like some of the other picnics that you don't feel comfortable going to. The family of God. The saved are willing to lay down their life for those people. The family of God, Christians, brothers and sisters in church willing to do anything for them. Willing to lay down our lives for others means putting them first and making their needs more important than our needs. It means we give ourselves up for one another. It means we give up our time, we give up our energy, and even give up our money sometime to show and demonstrate our love for a brother or sister in Christ. We pray for them. We fight for them. We defend them. We show that true love by being willing to lay down our lives. And we don't know. Hopefully that will never happen. I know those things happen in churches. There was a story just recently out in California. And a, a doctor, a great doctor that I was talking to somebody, and knew someone of this man that was killed in a shooting in a church. But several of those men in that church thankfully laid down their lives and, and got the, 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 the bad guy and, and held him down. And he didn't take too many lives. But we might say, well, I don't know if I'll ever have to lay down my life in that situation. But I hope that we'll have that kind of love at least in our heart for one another in this building. Hope we have that kind of love for one another in our Christian family. It's a sad day that it's not just today, all the years, the great division that you see within the family of God. You know, one of the great abominations that God hates is it says, He that soweth discord among the brethren. God wants unity within the local assembly. Not discord among the brethren. And when somebody says, I'm willing as a Christian to lay down my life for them. Oh, that means if we're willing to go that far, that means we're not going to talk about them behind their back. If we're willing to lay down our life for somebody, that means that we'll pray for them daily. If we're willing to lay down our life for that brother or sister in our church house, that means that we'll defend them and be with them and help them. Simple, or if you think about the couple of S's underneath the same I, the siblings lay down their life for one another. And I'm talking about the family of God siblings. I'm so thankful for my brothers, Joel and Jonathan, and my sisters, Sheila and Sonia. And I truly believe I would lay down my life for any of those four people. They're my flesh and blood. I love them, and they love me, and I'd be willing to die for them. But you also are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And may we be willing to lay down our lives for our friends, to love them, support them, encourage them, to be loyal to them, to not hurt them. We often tell kids, if you can't say something nice, don't say it at all. Why don't we tell adults that? May we be careful about the words we say to hurt others within the family of God. But oh, I'm willing to lay my life down for them, but I won't even look at them in church. That's a real problem. I'm going to lay down my life for the brother, but I'm going to shake their hand during shaking hand time. Lay down our lives. The same lays down his life for his friends. The sibling lays his life down, but also a spouse lays down his life for his friend. Let me look at Ephesians there. If you turn there quickly. Ephesians, I'll preach to your husbands and myself. I'll preach to his men for a moment here. Ephesians chapter 5. I actually used this at our prayer breakfast last time we met. 
And uh, but it's quite the challenge here in Ephesians chapter 5. And look at verse number 24. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. Then the challenge is here to you men. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Jesus Christ was willing to Love us so much that he gave his life for the church. And man, that is the challenge that we are given today as husbands. That as we met in that room with your preacher, as he counseled you when you were engaged before you were ready to get married, he said, I'd be willing to die for her. And that's the challenge here, that you need to love your wife as much as Christ gave himself for the church. Look at verse 28. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loved his wife loved himself. And I hope you'd be willing to die for your own wife or you, the women would be willing to die for your husbands. But maybe we have that thought in the back of our hearts and minds every day. On the day-to-day -day challenges of life as you're raising children, as you're dealing with the financial dilemma and stress that everybody is dealing with right now in America, as you're challenged with new opportunities and oppositions and, and things within your marriage, the greatest attack right now that the devil is attacking is the home, attacking marriages, attacking families. And we'd be, we'd be better be willing to lay down our life and do anything for our wives. Gentlemen, if we can speak those words, I'd be willing to die for my wife, but then we don't pray for her. Poor hypocrite. If we're willing to say, I'd be willing to take a bullet for my wife, but I don't tell her I love her every day that I'm a hypocrite. If I'm willing to say, I'll, I'll burn for her in a building to save her life, but then we don't, we don't treat her with kindness and respect and love her more than myself, then I am a hypocrite and I am not demonstrating the love of Christ. The saved lay down their life for their friend. Let me finish with this story that I want to read. I hope you'll listen, try not to bore you with this. But a gentleman that laid down his life for a soldier. The Bible, or not Bible, the story here. A wealthy man and his son loved to collect rare works of art. They had everything in their collection. Picasso and Raphael. And they would often sit together and admire the great works of art. When the Vietnam conflict broke out, the son went to war. He was very courageous and died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified and grieved deeply for his son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock at the door. A young man stood at the door with a large package in his hands. He said, Sir, you don't know me, but I am the soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day, and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart, and he died instantly. He often talked about you and loved your love for art. The young man held out this package. I know this isn't much. I'm not really a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. The father opened the package. It was a portrait of his son painted by the young man. He started, or he stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in the painting. The father was so drawn to the eyes that his own eyes welled up with tears. He thanked the young son and offered to pay him for the picture. Oh, no, sir, I could never repay what your son did for me. It's a gift. The father hung the portrait over his mantle. And every time a visitor would come to his home, that was the first picture that he would show. The man died a few months later. There was to be a great auction of his paintings. Many influential people came to this, gathered together to see the great paintings and had an opportunity to purchase one of their own for a collection. On the platform sat the painting of the sun. The auctioneer pounded his gavel. We will start the bidding with the picture of the sun. Who will bid for this picture? There was a silence. Then a voice in the back of the room shouted, We want to see some famous pictures. Skip this one. But the auctioneer persisted. Will someone bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? $100, $200 question? Another voice shouted angrily, We didn't come to see this painting. We came to see uh, Rembrandt's and other ones that were important. Get on with the real bids. 
But still the auctioneer continued. The son, the son, who will take the son? Finally, a voice came from the very back of the room. It was the longtime gardener of the man and his son. I'll give $10 for the painting. Being a poor man, it was all he could afford. We have $10, who will bid $20? Give it to him for $10. Let's see the master, someone shouted. $10 is the bid. Won't someone bid $20? Question mark. The crowd was becoming angry. They didn't want the picture of the sun. They wanted the more worthy investments for their collections. The auctioneer pounded the gavel. Going once, twice, sold for $10. A man sitting on the second row shouted, Now let's get on with the collections. The auctioneer laid down his gavel. I'm sorry, the auction is over. What about the paintings? Question. I am sorry. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. I was not allowed to reveal the stipulation until this time. Only the painting of the sun would be auctioned. Whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate, including the paintings. The man who took the son gets everything. God gave his son 2,000 years ago to die on a cruel cross. Much like the auctioneer, his message today is the son, the son. Who will take the son? Because you see, whoever takes the son gets everything. Aren't you grateful for Jesus Christ? Greater love and no man than this. That a man laid down his life for his friends. And Jesus laid down his life for you. May we love him and worship him daily. May we promote him and brag on him to everyone. And that soldier out there has laid down his life for you. And I hope today in response you'll be willing, as a saved man, as a saved woman, as a Christian, you'll be willing to lay down your life for your spouse. You'll be willing to lay down your life for your kids. You'll be willing to lay down your life for your Christian family, your, your, your church family, the, the family of God. He says, I command you to love one another as I have loved you. Be willing to die for them. Do you love Jesus enough that you will lay down your life for him? Hope this week, we say, I'd be willing to do that. Hope this week we'll spend time worshiping him, praying to him talking about him to others. I hope you as a Christian and myself that will love one another as Jesus has loved us. Let's close our eyes and our heads, please. Thank you so much for listening so well. And appreciate, once again, your faithfulness in church this day.